All right, so for this next one, we're gonna really focus on the physiology of the skin. So we're gonna talk about sensory nerve endings and what they do. Um, we're gonna talk about turnover, carotenization, desquamation, um, skin pigmentation and melanin and how it's produced and how melanin levels can result in different skin colors. We're gonna talk about some disorders when it comes to melanin and then burns, skin cancer, wound healing and aging. So a lot that's gonna be covered here, but we're not gonna go super deep. All right, so let's start with receptors. We have a few different types, like a few different like classifications. We have tactile receptors, thermal receptors, and nociceptors. Uh, tactile receptors are going to be modified in nerve endings, so they're modified for the sense of touch. So tickling, touch, pressure, vibration, right, things like that. So if something, you know, like a little insect were to crawl across your skin, right, or if someone were to push their finger into the side of your arm, right, tactile receptors are the ones who will do that. Right, and so we see some of them, like these Merkel discs will be for touch, these Krauss end bulbs, right, the root hair plexus, so if the hair moves, right, um, even so like, like if a little bug crawls across your skin and it's just on your hair rather than on your skin, you still notice it because of that. The Ruffini endings for pressure, we have uh, Piscinian corpuscles for pressure, and Meisner corpuscles for touch, which is going to be like vibration. So a lot of a lot of them are going into touch, but if you notice, a lot of them kind of specialize. They'll specialize in different parts of touch or different different senses of touch. The thermal receptors, which are these free nerve endings, that's going to be for things like temperature as well as pain. Um, so thermal receptors for hot and cold, but they they kind of serve as dual purpose with these free nerve endings. They also serve as nociceptors, where we detect pain. Basically, they detect the prostaglandins that get released when a cell is damaged. So if you get like a cut, let's say, those damaged cells from that cut will release the prostaglandins, which then will be sensed by these free nerve endings. So let's talk about how cells move from that basal layer all the way up. So they're coming from that basal layer and cells, these carotenocytes are going to migrate from that bottom layer all the way up to the surface. And as they move up, they're going to go through changes that help us keep that watertight barrier as well as to just re replenish the skin. It, it's on the outside of your body. It's facing all the elements. Um, these cells have to be tough and they have to be replaceable. Um, so death is inevitable. As the cells move away from the dermis, right, as they move from that basal layer up and away, remember there's no blood supply, which means things like oxygen, things like carbon dioxide, like the nutrients, things the cells needs are not getting to them as easily. And things uh, like waste products are not going to diffuse away as easily. So as we get to the surface, the death of the cell is going to happen regardless. In the basal layer, that's gonna be our basal stem cell, right? This is where we're producing keratin, this is where we're producing those cells, right? This is where all of these carotenocytes are coming from. And then as they move up, they go to the spinosum we're now metabolically active. We're making those 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 granules of the um, keratin. We're making those lamellar bodies for the lipid uh, protections. They move up to the granulosum. The cells are now actively starting to die, and they're going to start releasing these components outside of the cells. So those. Um, the, those lipids are going to be released on the outside to form the lipid envelope and then the keratin fibers inside are going to start to cross-link to form an envelope inside. So we get a protein envelope inside, we get a lipid barrier, or lipid envelope outside. As we move up, right, we get through the lucidum, we get to the corneum, now the cells have fully died, they're, carotina, they're carotinized, and they're going to start to go through desquamation, which means we're going to start to detach Right, so all the little desmosomes and all the little junctions, right, like this guy here, that were keeping the cells kind of anchored to each other, those are going to start to dissolve and break down. So we have enzymes that will break them down and then the cells can be released, right? And so that's when like, I mean, you're constantly shedding skin and the ones that are at the very top in that corneum are the ones being shed. So we're going through this process, we're changing as we go up through the layers, 
we're getting more, we're going through car uh, carotenization, we're forming that water barrier, and then eventually we die and are exfoliated off. It takes about four weeks for a cell to go from the bottom all the way up to the top, but this is regulated by your hormones. So growth hormone, inflammation, things like that um, can, can control how fast that turnover rate is. Um, sometimes we can actually use topicals um, to regulate turnover. So turnover can be regulated by retinoids. So if you've ever um, heard about retinol, um, it's a topical that can be given um, in like a form of a cream that helps normalize that epidermal turnover um, so that your skin is refreshing itself basically. And then we can increase the rate of the desquamation through AHA and BHA acids, right? Alpha hydroxy acids and beta hydroxy acids, which um, are common in skincare products to basically take the, some of those dead, you know, dead skin cells off. So we reveal newer skin underneath. Um, this is helpful for people who maybe have a certain skin conditions because um, the cells are dead and building up, but they're getting stuck in things like pores, they're getting stuck in things like the hair follicles, which can then lead to acne. So AHAs and BHAs kind of help remove those skin cells to help prevent that clogging from happening. Now, if you have psoriasis, um, your cell turnover is happening very quickly, but the desquamation process is not. And so this is where someone would get the buildup of those plaques, right? They get these scaly, um, basically compacted pieces of skin, right, that have died um, because the cells have turned over and you're getting, like, instead of having just, like, the nice 15 to 20 layers of the cell, of cells in the corneum, you're getting way more than that and they're not they're not breaking down those desmosomes and they're not being, you know, shed off of the skin. So there's a buildup of that skin, of those dead skin cells. Now skin color, pigmentation comes from a combination of different, um, different pigments, um, one of which you're probably familiar with is melanin. There's actually a couple different types. But let's go ahead and talk about some of these. So there's beta carotene. Beta carotene is a yellow orange lipid soluble pigment. Um, it's what you would find in things like carrots and whatnot, and it's converted to vitamin A. Um, if someone, you know, you have this normally stored in your hypodermis, but if someone were to over consume vitamin A, um, this can lead to carotenosis. This is gonna lead to a yellowing of the skin. Um, this is not the same as lipid of the liver like failing, right? It's not necessarily the same as jaundice. So keep that in mind. It looks similar in that there's a yellowing, but it's a different component that is building up. So jaundice is when you have a buildup of bilirubin, whereas this is a buildup of beta carotenes. Now hemoglobin, the red pigment in your red blood cells, Right, this flows through dermal capillaries, and if there's an increase in blood flow, you could end up with erythemia or hyperemia. This is just that red, like flushed look in the face. And then melanin, this is gonna be the most important pigment we find in the skin. This is what's coming from the melanocytes, and this is gonna be our UV protection. There are two different kinds though, pheomelanin and eumelanin. Pheomelanin is actually a yellow red color. This is what gives like red hair that nice, bright, vibrant color. Um, it can absorb some UV light, but it's not very, it's not fantastic at it. And so this causes people to burn easily because it doesn't work as well at absorbing UV light. That being said, it is fantastic for helping you with the production of vitamin D. Eumelanin is usually what you're probably thinking of when you think of melanin, and this is the brown-black pigment that gives that, that very rich brown coloring to hair, to eyes, and to skin. This is very good at absorbing UV light, and so you don't burn very easily when you have more eumelanin. You also experience less photoaging, so less wrinkling and things like that, and um, less skin cancer because of the UV absorption. That being said, it's not as helpful when it comes to vitamin D synthesis.
So let's talk about melanin a little bit deeper. It's the primary pigment that's gonna give us our col the color in our skin, the color in our hair, and the colors in our eyes. And so it's, it's really gonna be the, a very visible right, component to our bodies. Um, its whole job is to absorb UV light. It will help with uh, free radicals, right, so that we can prevent skin cancers. And it's coming from melanocytes, which are basically taking tyrosine and converting it into melanin. So some people don't have the enzyme in this tyrosinase. And so because they don't have tyrosinase, they don't produce melanin, right? It's just tyrosine. And so there's no melanin and this would lead to someone to be albino. Um, there are normal diff you know, different you know, differences in skin color because the levels of tyrosinase in the body, and this is going to be um, regulated by uh, the melanin stimulating hormone, estrogen, UVB, um, not necessarily the number of melanocytes, right? So we will we'll see the melanocytes, but it's like how active are the melanocytes because how much of this enzyme do they have, right? The more of this enzyme you have, right, then the more melanin you can produce. So how much of the enzyme and how fast the enzyme can function determines how much pigment, right, how much melanin is being produced. The more active they are, the more melanin, the deeper the color, right? The less enzyme, the less activity, less melanin is produced, the lighter the color. So what can happen when it comes to melanin? What are some conditions? One you've probably been um, talked about, you know, talked to about a, a handful of times, and that's albinism. This is a genetic disorder, right? That tyrosinase is not produced, right? We don't have that enzyme, or the enzyme is non-functional, and so melanin is not produced, which means this is something someone is born with, right? So they have no melanin, absolutely like, at all, and so you would see this person would have very, 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 very fair skin. I mean, almost perfectly white. They would not have any coloring in their hair. Their eyes would also not have any coloring, right? So they would have like almost a, a blue-red appearance. And this is something someone is born with. Albinism can affect a person from any part of the world um, because it is genetic. So someone, whether let's say you have two parents who are Caucasian versus two parents who are not, right? Doesn't matter, right? This is genetic. So you can have two parents who are um, of African descent, we'll say, and they can have an albino child, right, because it's just a genetic disorder. Um, vitiligo, this is an autoimmune disorder where, so th this is a person who is born producing melanin. They can produce melanin just fine up until the point where the autoimmune disorder kicks in, in which case the target of the autoimmune disorder are the melanocytes. So the melanocytes are destroyed by these um, T cells that are part of the immune system. Um, if the melanocytes are attacked, they get destroyed, and if they're destroyed, there's no melanin produced. So this, and this happens in patches. So someone with vitiligo, they are born with their, with their natural pigment, right? Their natural color. Um, but over time, there's patches of skin where the melanocytes have been destroyed, and those patches start usually start in certain areas like on the face and the hands and whatnot and then spread over time right so it's a more of a patchwork appearance um, this is most notable noticeable in people of color because the contrast between the darker um, skin that is has not been affected yet and the light patches where the melanocytes have already been destroyed however it can impact anyone um, of any color right um, it's just more noticeable in certain populations because of the high contrast between the deeper melanated skin and the um, skin that has been affected where the melanocytes have been destroyed. But again, it can, it can impact anyone of any color, any melanin production level. Next is wound healing. So how do we heal the wounds? Because the skin is exposed to the external environment. It's bound to get damage from time to time, right? If it's the epidermis, this is a superficial wound. We don't have any bleeding because there's no blood vessels. And so basically we have, you know, we, we see like that little cut, that um, basal mem uh, membrane or that basal um, 
stratum basal is going to divide to seal itself off, to reconnect itself, and then from there we will start producing cells from that stratum basal upward. And so you see you're kind of just rebuilding layer by layer, starting with the base and then moving your way up, right? Until we get all the way up and we've reformed all layers, including the corneum. So with this, um, healing is pretty rapid. You don't really see any wounds. You don't really see any scars um, because we don't have to do any extensive re like remodeling of any sort. Um, so this is something that, you know, it would be really mild, it would disappear, and then you'd probably never notice it again. But if you get a deeper wound, right, you get a cut, you experience bleeding, right, because now we've gone down into the dermis or further, right, this is where we have deep wound healing. So the first and foremost, what we have to do is we have to maintain homeostasis, which means clotting. We need to stop the bleeding. The immediate damage needs to be kind of controlled. So we're doing immediate damage control by clotting, forming this temporary um, scaffold, right, with that clot to stop the bleeding. Then the inflammatory response comes in because we've, we've breached the barrier, and so bacteria, debris have possibly gotten in, and so the immune response will kick in so that phagocytes like neutrophils and whatnot can come in and destroy any bacteria, any pathogens that got in. From there, we need to rebuild the extracellular matrix. This is where fibroblasts come in. So fibroblasts are cells that build new fibers. So they'll build new collagen and fibronectin. They'll basically form the new permanent scaffolding. They'll, build, they'll help with building new blood vessels in this phase and then replicating any epithelial cells. And then remodeling, we're basically gonna try to remodel the tissue as back to normal as possible. It's not always perfect. So if we look at what's happening, here's the blood clot to the wound, right? We see that we are starting to kind of try to rebuild that stratum basal so that the epidermis can heal itself. We see that we have white blood cells coming in. They're trying to phagocytize, destroy any pathogens that are there, right? Fibroblasts, like these guys would start building new um, fibers like collagen to stretch across. We would fix the damaged blood vessels. We would cause new blood vessels to kind of form or reform um, to restore them. And then what we're left with is a little bit of scar tissue. So we work to try to get back to normal as much as possible. However, um, it's never perfect. And so you'll always have a little bit of scar tissue. Um, left behind. Depending on the damage, can it can cause how much scar tissue or how visible or obvious that scar tissue is to vary. Right? Usually, the more traumatic the wound, like the scar tissue is more apparent. Now, sometimes there are challenges in healing. Um, depending on who you are, um, you can experience these. So, hypertrophic scarring. This is where the fibroblasts kind of go overboard and build too much collagen and th this leads to extra fibers there being built there. This is lead this leads to a scar that is thick and raised. Um, this is what we call a keloid. So you may have heard of keloid scarring. Um, this can happen in anyone, but we do see that it tends to be more common in people with a darker complexion. Um, these can be modified. So if someone has keloid scarring, um, there are procedures dermatologists can do to help uh, alleviate the keloid, to try to limit the keloid. Um, that being said, it's not perfect because if you develop this type of scarring to start, you've, any sort of procedure could lead to more of this. Um, but it, it's something that a dermatologist would be able to care for um, because they would have the best methods for either revising a keloid or preventing one in the first place. Hypotrophic. Um, scarring, these are where you have like pits, right, or, or um, there's all sorts of them like ice pick scars or shallow like disc-like scars, but this is where the skin has kind of sunken in, in those scarred areas. This is where there's too little collagen that is formed from the fibroblasts. This leads to a small pit, right, some sort of, of de uh, deviation downward. This is really common with people who have acne. So people who have acne or who have had acne, especially um, severe cases or moderate to severe cases of acne um, and the deeper like hormonal type or cystic acne um, can develop these types of scars. 
It's also more common to develop these scars if the person with acne um, bothers it, right? So if they're trying to squeeze them or pop them um, or pick at them in any way, that can increase the risk of this type of scarring. There are some things that can be done to help with that, so things like microneedling, laser revision, and whatnot, those are things that can help. They can't necessarily eliminate the scarring, but they can help with the scarring. Um, for very deep ones, it's common to use things like fillers, the same way someone would use fillers for like cosmetic procedures, for like their lips. Um, same kind of thing can be done there. You can imagine though, it is, um, it is not cheap to get that done. Lastly, we have chronic wounds where the wound has just is not healing properly. So like an ulcer, we are just not healing at all. There's the blood flow is too poor or there's a, a severe infection, right? This is problematic. We especially see this in diabetics, especially diabetics who are not well controlled um, because that person, especially um, if it have, they have uncontrolled diabetes, they likely also have neuropathy which means wounds are left to fester or problems, especially like the feet are left to fester and ulcers can develop including underneath calluses. So someone can have a callus and then an ulcer develop underneath and then if something happens, the callus is damaged or whatever, we can introduce pathogens to cause an infection, right? Major problem for diabetics, right? We remember that from our endocrine system coverage where we talked about how neuropathy um, and slow, you know, slow wound healing and all that can really form this um, perfect storm for losing digits, right? Having to go through amputations of fingers, of toes, of feet, or entire limbs. Uh, burns, this is where we have excessive tissue damage because of heat, electricity, radioactivity, or chemicals. So basically, like, this is where we just have a kind of tissue damage and mass for various reasons. Um, they are going to be graded based on severity. Pretty much everyone has probably experienced a first degree burn at some point in their life. This is just the epidermis. So a person with a first degree burn would have just redness. So if you've ever like maybe had something splash on you while you were cooking or you've experienced a sunburn, that's generally a first degree burn where you just have, it hurts and it's red and then over time it fades. A second degree burn, this is where we've gone from just hurting the epidermis to down below with the dermis. So we see some more intense um, symptoms and signs at this point. We see swelling, redness, we can see blisters. It can be very painful. This can also lead to some scarring on occasion. Um, and we definitely can see some photo damage. So freckles and things that were not there before can develop in response to that. Um, some, you know, some people may have experienced a second degree burn. And then of the three that we're gonna talk about, right, the third degree burn is the worst of them because we've gone all the way down to the fatty tissue. We've completely destroyed tissue so that it is now turned black or brown or white, right? It no longer looks normal. We look at the picture here, we see like that tissue is highly destroyed, right? Um, and we're not just destroying the skin, we're also destroying all the, or the accessory organs with it. So the hair follicles, the nerves, um, we can see numbness, right? We can see problems with sensory information and we can experience severe scarring. Um, this usually, not usually, this requires medical intervention. Um, second degree burns can also require medical intervention. First degree burns are generally treated at home for the most part. Second degree may need a medical intervention. Third degree, you definitely need medical intervention because at this point now, you also have to think about the risk of infection that's usually the thing that hurts people the most after burns is not necessarily just the burn itself, but the risk of infection because we have destroyed um, the one of the biggest protective features we have against pathogens. The next thing that can go wrong is skin cancer. So skin cancer, right? The, we're, we're constantly exposing our skin to UV light, to chemicals, to all sorts of environmental um, components, right? That can cause harm. And so, especially as you get older, skin cancer can develop because the constant and regular exposure. Um, and we usually find one of these four, but the top three are probably the most uh, common. So let's take a peek. 
We have basal cell carcinoma. This is the most common. It's coming from the basal stem cells. This is usually slow and it usually doesn't metastasize. So as weird as it sounds, um, if you're gonna get skin cancer, this is the one you want. <laughs> if we look at what it looks like, it looks like something like this, although there can be variations in how these look, but we tend to see something that looks kind of like a, a reddish, um, kind of sort of scabby kind of bump, right? It's almost like a, a very strange pimple in a way. Um, this again, the, the usual treatment is just to cut it out, right? Excise the tissue and then stitch it up, right? Um, and because it's so slow, because it doesn't really metastasize, there's no reason to go overboard and do anything crazy like chemotherapy. Um, next would be the second most common, which is squamous cell carcinoma. This is coming from the carotinocytes. This can sometimes metastasize. It looks like this kind of scabby appearance. And again, um, it, it's not as severe as the other ones. Um, it's gonna be somewhere up there with basal cell carcinoma in that most of the time people who have this are going to just have an excision done where they go in, they remove the tissue and stitch the person up. Now, as we go down to malignant melanoma, melanoma is more rare, but it is much more serious compared to the other two. This is coming from the melanocytes, and this does have a, um, a high chance of spreading, right? This is going to show up as a mole that has changed. So usually you're looking at the A, B, C, D, E rules, right? Like what is, is it abnormal in shape? Is it abnormal in color, border, right? All those types of things are coming into play. Um, size, right? And this is where people get like skin checks. They're looking at any sort of markings on someone to see if they um, meet any of those criteria that are, need to be investigated. Uh, melanoma definitely needs to be treated depending on the severity. It can be something like surgery, just doing an excision, but it could also include um, things like radiation and or chemotherapy depending on how it has spread. And then lastly, the a very rare one is the Merkel cell carcinoma, which is this one. It looks almost like an abscess or it looks like a, like a pimple. Um, this is a neuroendocrine carcinoma. So this is coming from the Merkel cells, which are again, our nervous tissue. This is also something that needs to be taken care of ASAP. And so the treatment of that can range from excision all the way up to, um, to chemotherapy, depending on what has happened and what stage. Some precancerous um, lesions can in, that can basically is like the precursor, like this is your warning. You might have skin cancer or you may develop skin cancer later includes actinic keratosis or AK. This is where you get these little scaly non-pigmented plaques of abnormal growth. Um, this can progress to squamous cell carcinoma, so it's important to get it checked. And then seborrheic keratosis is these like waxy um, scaly kind of appearance. It almost kind of looks like a, like almost like a, a cracked mole in a way. Um, this is very common in older adults, right? So both of these are not cancer themselves, but it would be something that a person would probably either want to keep an eye on or have treated before it became cancerous. Some other things that happen that we try to avoid, but we cannot avoid them forever is the normal aging of the skin. So as we get older, your fibroblasts are going to slow down. And as your fibroblasts slow down, that means less collagen, less elastin, less hyaluronic acid, which means the skin will start to thin, it'll start to weaken and wrinkle. So um, this, like as someone gets older right here, we see like there's lots of thick collagens and all sorts of fibers, fibroblasts are going crazy, right? But as we get older, we see that, oh man, there's less fibers there to kind of prop everything up. There's less hyaluronic acid to help retain moisture. And so the skin starts to develop these little wrinkles in it, right? Um, we, so the skin gets thinner, it wrinkles, the melanocytes slow down as well. So we see that the hair thins and grays out um, and that skin is more prone to damage. Um, this is a big issue when it comes to phlebotomy. If you've ever noticed an older person it's easier for them to get injuries that draw blood. So they're, it's easier for them to get cuts and it's easier for them to bruise. So someone who needs a blood draw, right? Someone who's like in their 20s or 30s, 
right? They get a blood draw, they put a little Band-Aid on it, they're fine, right? But someone who's older, 60s, 70s, 80s plus, right? They may develop a, a nice bruise where they had to get their blood draw.